Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, which is titled Your Salvation from High Software Licensing Cost and Servers Prowl. This webinar is brought to you by Express Computer in partnership with IBM. I'm Mohit Rathod, Senior Correspondent with Express Computer. Businesses have braced themselves through the disruption and they are now looking at IT to help thrive in the new normal. IT projects are in the top priority list and rightly so. The CIO today has to adopt modern digital practices that integrate seamlessly in the current IT setup. He also has to ensure performance, availability, security, scale and cost. Sharing with you more about this in this discussion today, we have our speakers for the day. Ravi Jain, the director at to IBM Server Solution Sales India and South Asia. Ravi is responsible for IBM Z Systems and Linux One and IBM Cognitive Systems. In his role, he drives the IT infrastructure solutions that are driving digital transformation. He has kickstarted it. He has kickstarted the pivot to industry standard Linux and open source platforms. He holds a B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering from IIT Delhi and a postgraduate diploma in Business Management from IIM Bangalore. And we also have with us uh, Jay Paul Anthony, who is the Executive IT Economics Practitioner, IBM IT Economics Team, IBM Competitive Project Office. As an IT economic consultant, Jay Paul conducts studies that focuses on competitive positioning of various products in servers, storage, cloud, and analytics areas, and conducts economic studies that help within, with the optimization of clients' IT infrastructure. He has more than 20 years of industry experience, and Jayapal holds Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from University of Missouri in the US. He also holds an MBA in Information Systems from Pace University, New York. But before I hand over the stage to them, I will quickly read out the house rules. This webinar is being broadcasted live and will be available as on demand. We will have a round of Q&A at the end of the webinar. However, I urge you to send in your questions at any time during the webinar. You can do so by using the questions text box. We will also have a short survey at the end of the webinar a form will open in the browser window after the webinar ends. So I request each one of you to participate in the same as your feedback is very important to us. If you face any technical issues, please try to refresh your browser or else reach out to our team using the same questions text box. If you have any further questions or if you wish to interact with the speakers, please leave a comment using the questions text box and the IBM team will contact you post the webinar. So that's all from my side now. Without taking much of your time, I invite uh, Ravi and Jaypal to take the session forward. Thank you, Mohit. It's a pleasure to be here. And good afternoon, everyone. I think Jay Jaypal is trying to unmute himself. Yeah, sorry, I, was, uh, I lost my screen. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Mohit, for that wonderful introduction. And welcome to this webinar. It would be a pleasure for us to talk to you this afternoon. So um, Ravi, I think we'll have a conversation about uh, the current environment and what is happening in the last few months. So, so last year, as we all know, you know, with all of this pandemic and, and it's still continuing into this year, it has transformed our lives and the way we do business, right? There's a lot of things happening out there. Um, the technology, more than ever is gaining a lot of importance in driving this change within the enterprises. Um, they have to ad adopt to various uh, changes and user behaviors. Um, so having been in this industry and having seen what's going on, what is your take on the changes that you're seeing and where do you see the future of IT infrastructure, you know, mainly from the perspective of servers and storage Right, given these changes and, and the so-called new normal that we are in. Can you 
give us your perspective on those, uh, Ravi? Uh, absolutely, Jaypal. And uh, I think uh, for the last eight to 10 months, uh, there have been several discussions around uh, what's going to be the impact on IT, what is going to be the role of IT. And, uh, you know, uh, this dialogue in the last eight to 10 months also has undergone a lot of uh, changes. Uh, and the reason being, the whole time was so dynamic. In fact, uh, you know, for the first three months, it was actually a period of uh, uncertainty on every aspect, right? I mean, uh, it was not just about the uh, work side, but, you know, more, more importantly, people were really worried about how, how the life will be for everyone. Yeah. Uh, one thing that uh, came out very clearly uh, in the last eight to 12 months uh, is the focus on keeping the uh, business applications available. Uh, it is about uh, 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 people would say working from home, uh, people would call it 24 by seven access, uh, 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 access to the business applications. But one thing was very clear that I will not have the luxury to do uh, minute by minute or hour by hour management, right? So in that sense, how am I keeping the digital resiliency or the data resiliency or the resi resiliency of the enterprise applications in order. Uh, that was uh, clearly in the spotlight and it remained so for the first, uh, you know, uh, it was the only spotlight for the five to six months uh, at the start of the pandemic. And uh, as we, uh, you know, uh, uh, went through the year, obviously the focus uh, came back on the digital transformation projects which people were embarking upon. So pre-pandemic, the whole idea was how are we transforming our businesses with the help of IT? What is the digital transformation all about? It took a bit of a backseat, but again, it started coming back to prominence. And, and the reason is when, uh, when the first wave kind of crossed, uh, every business, every organization was introspecting how do I conduct my business uh, in a different fashion uh, with, with uh, limited face-to-face -face interactions, limited physical interactions? How do I keep myself uh, afloat, so to say? And there are industries which got hit badly, right? I mean, travel and transportation is one clear example. Uh, retail, uh, the physical retail was another example. But we have, uh, you know, various new things coming up. So obviously uh, not every organization has been able to come back uh, in terms of the uh, uh, putting the business back on track, but a lot of focus definitely came on uh, infrastructure, uh, which obviously relates to server and storage. And in addition to the uh, digital resiliency or data resiliency part of it, uh, one more thing which came out very clearly was about how do I keep my uh, entire infrastructure agile? And in that context, the use of cloud, and, and when I say use this word cloud, I do not necessarily mean public cloud. I'm talking about cloud as a capability because that capability gives me agility. It gives me control on the workloads to move them at will from one, or a one cloud environment to another cloud environment to be more agile, to be able to uh, support my business better. So uh, two things emerged, uh, digital resiliency, uh, the focus on cloud, and the underpinning uh, fundamental principles will still always remain the same, that I need to do this at uh, the most optim in, in the most optimized manner. So if I got some emergency budgets, they are not going to remain forever. So my costs have to be in control. And I need to have a capability delivered by my server and storage, which can cut across multiple environments. So the interoperability was also a big focus area as far as server and storage were concerned. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. Yeah, you covered a lot of uh, uh, ground over there. Um, and it is a wonderful summary uh, on how the enterprises are transforming, right? Uh, especially given this uh, pandemic era, if I may call that, right? And uh, and a lot of things are happening around the workloads as well. Like if you look at the core workloads and the new digital workloads that you're talking about, um, they are gaining equal 
uh, importance, right? Um, so given the, given that kind of scenario and the transformations that the ent enterprises are going through, what's your take on IT architectures in the future, right? Um, how are they transforming? It's not enough if you have the infrastructure changing, but the IT architecture needs to keep pace with a change in um, the business transformations as well, right? So, so could you give us a perspective on so, that as uh, well? Uh, Jay Paul, a very valid uh, point you brought up, right? Uh, uh, while we have focus on uh, data and AI and cloud and you know resiliency, uh, it all really boils down to what is the underlying architecture. Now, uh, it, it is an it, it is very impractical to say that you know uh, I I will just uh, do away with everything that I had and you know I I will have you know something new coming up. So the architectures are evolving. And if we currently look at the landscape of the infrastructure that is there, uh, you will find three clear, uh, uh, I would say, uh, parts to it. The first part is where uh, you already had your core workloads, your core mission critical workloads running. It could be core banking, core insurance, core ERPs, you know, core line of business applications, which are the core transaction processing systems. Okay, mm -hmm. these are the most robust uh, in terms of you know the architectures that uh, clients have deployed, organizations have deployed. Uh, you have all the resiliency, the zero data loss, uh, you know those kind of architectures available, and then you have a set of workloads which are emerging. Now, when I say these emerging workloads, uh, they could be new applications which are cloud native by their very nature, which means they are deployed in container form, microservices, and, and there is a whole new world of you know uh, application which is emerging. And it could also be the modernization of the existing application in the form of containers and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, and in addition to this, you have applications or workloads being used directly from the public cloud, which have no infrastructure intervention as far as the on-premise uh, hardware server storage is concerned. Now, the architecture which is evolving is, uh, is very clearly a hybrid architecture. And when I say a hybrid architecture, it is not just the uh, presence of multiple cloud environments or multiple environments. Hybrid actually for uh, what we mean, what I mean by saying hybrid is that I should have the capability to use these multiple environments as a single capacity at an abstract level. So whether it is compute, whether it is storage, I should be able to run not only my uh, mission critical workloads, which are residing on premise, I should be able to support architectures of Linux containers, uh, container orchestration, which can then give me control to move my workloads across. Like I was mentioning in the beginning, the, uh, there has to be a control associated with it in the sense that I, I need to have, uh, uh, I, I should be able to decide where should I move the workload at what point in time. The second piece is uh, with respect to uh, the data resiliency or digital resiliency, which I was mentioning, uh, there is a clear focus and a lot of clients in the last six to eight months have opened up dialogues with respect to the DR, uh, with respect to the high availability architectures, a zero, dot, zero data loss uh, architectures. And the dialogue is not that just give me more capacity in a disaster recovery site. I mean, that will be yeah. a very no brainer kind of a dialogue, right? right. But the dialogue is uh, really, how can I have high availability? How can I have a disaster recovery? But I do not want to spend the same money which I spent on the production site, right? So I, in, a, in, in an incremental cost, okay, which is not 2x of the existing environment, you know, uh, with, with that incremental investment, how can I uh, improve my high availability and uh, disaster recovery? So uh, these are some of the things which are, you know, uh, uh, determining the way the architectures are going to be decided not only for server but for storage and one yeah. point uh, which i would like to add over here which is not really with respect to the architecture of the hardware 
but it is the functionality and that is with respect to data security and data privacy because we are talking about digital transformation we are talking about new workloads coming in we are also talking about new regulations coming in because the way the businesses are being done is going to undergo a significant change we will see regulation around around the uh, workloads around the infrastructure around the multiple data centers you know uh, that is ever evolving and those regulations are going to you know be always uh, they will bring uh, changes with the uh, with the objective of keeping the data secure and the privacy also maintained for the users now what what does that mean that means that there will always be a moving goal post with respect to the data security and privacy norms and that will also be an essential part of the overall server and storage architecture as to if i am using a particular server or a storage how am i ensuring that my uh, regulation uh, regulatory norms are kind of covered and i don't have to really reinvent my application or recode my application uh, when i have to go through certain changes so uh, these are some of the things that uh, are going to decide the new architectures uh, jack all okay now uh, uh, while i talked about all this jaypal uh, you are coming from the it economics and research team and i know for a fact that you have worked with various clients uh, not just in yes. india but across the globe uh, where you have been you know talking about the uh, uh, best fit architectures not just from an uh, technology standpoint but also from the standpoint of you know uh, what is the total cost of ownership right uh, yep. uh, so what are your findings or what are your experiences of the last few quarters or you know, 8 to 9 months right yeah thanks ravi i mean a great question of course right it's you know businesses are transforming they want new technology to meet all of those new demands new workloads new regulations as you talked about right but they all come at a cost right and they all have options to deploy these things on different platforms different um you know clouds whether it's private or public or you know even hybrid kind of deployments but how do you determine the best fit like you say right best fit for that particular application for that particular solution where do they put it and how do they determine you know not only from a technology perspective you know from a cost perspective whether it is economically viable or is it economically the best solution to you know go to on to which platform to go to right it's a very hard questions that businesses have in front of them and one of the things that we do is look at tcl right the total cost of ownership of a solution on a particular platform or a particular choice of uh, platform to, to deploy this on right and as as you know in tco when you talk about tco um, there are lots of things about it right so first thing is what is the solution under consideration where are they deploying you have hyper convergent infrastructure like i said the the public cloud deployment the hybrid cloud many options right and and they have to narrow this down very quickly and they don't have a lot of time to also decide right they have to narrow this down very quickly once they determine the architecture that they have decided they have to determine where to deploy it how to deploy it and then finally determine what is it going to cost them and which option is the best option to um, you know go with based on all of those factors including the economics right so when i talk about tco you know a lot of people think about tco as just hardware um you know how much is a cloud going to cost how much is this hardware going to cost me uh, to put that in the infrastructure in in the in the data center and then they calculate the cost of hardware right but there's more to uh, more than that right more than just the hardware some some businesses would go ahead and say okay is it what about the software cost right um, but but I think of it as these four dimensions of TCL, right? Let me let me elaborate on those. 
One is, of course, the cost of components. I mean, you have hardware and software that is a no brainer, right? But then there, is, there are other things in that line item, right? In that dimension, cost of facilities, energy and space, how much power are you spending? How much space does your infrastructure take up, right? Uh, okay, cost of people to manage that infrastructure, all of those add up into that dimension of cost, right? Then, you know, when, when again, businesses, when, when I talk to, you know, some of the executives, uh, one of the things that I then elaborate on is the number of environments that they have to deploy this on, right? There's, of course, the production at the data center, the primary data center, but what about your DR strategy? And do you have non-production environments for your UAT, SIT, staging, et cetera? And, and they just multiply very quickly, right? And that's something that a lot of people don't uh, don't think about or you know pay a lot of attention to. They 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 look at the architecture, they look at where it's going to deploy, and then they uh, determine what 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 is needed without you know giving a lot of thought about uh, you know the other environments that they have to deploy this on that they need to have for uh, for the businesses to be successful, right? And the third sort of dimension that I want to talk about is the time dimension of TCL, right? Again, a, a dimension that not many businesses or many people take into consideration, right? This is cost of migration or time to market even, right? How fast can you deploy that application and monetize that application or get your business out there, right? Um, uh, and be the first mover. Right. So there is there is that aspect, uh, the time value of money, right? Not businesses do have to borrow money or businesses need that money to spend elsewhere. They have many investment choices, right, to make. And is this the right investment choice um, to make? They have to calculate the internal rate of return, the ROI, et cetera, et cetera. So the time value of money becomes a big factor, right? And then finally, uh, the fourth dimension of TCO is the business value, right? Uh, reliability, the cost of downtime, right? Uh, what, what if your application is down for a number of hours, right? Uh, how does it impact your revenue, right? Um, what does, uh, you know, how much loss is the business going to make? Um, uh, are there SLA penalties? If you're providing a service to somebody else, if your service is down, are there SLA penalties to the businesses or partners or others that you're supporting? Um, and of course, no one wants to think about this. It's a scary subject and a big topic. It's the cost of security, security breaches. Um, we see it every day, right? Uh, every few days you see in your newspapers, there's been security breaches. People have stolen data, um, attacked the, the you know, cost defacement of websites. Um, things like that happen all the time, right? So what is the cost of security or securing this infrastructure? And, and security breaches are real, right? And, and it's very expensive um, in, in many ways, right? Um, reputational loss being one of the biggest um, that you can think of, right? So those are um, some of the aspects of TCO, right? That we want people to think about. Um, uh, and put that into perspective. But most of the time, right, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try, try to summarize all of that and get to and distill this message completely, right? Um, if you take out the business value benefits and say, okay, that is separate from all other kind of costs that you get touch and feel, um, you know, most of the time, the hardware and software costs make up about 70 to 80% of all of this, right? So, so we can narrow down on that, right? And Ravi, you you may have seen this also, right? I mean, you know, with all of the clients that you talk to, um, many times the hardware and software budgets belongs to different departments, different organizations, and have completely separate budgets. They they go in different silos. They don't talk to each other. They don't know how much they're spending in hardware or the, the department that's procuring software or the applications don't know how much uh, they're spending on hardware and vice versa, right? And that's common across many of the businesses. Um, and I'm sure you are aware of it, right? Uh, but when you look at the TCO, these teams have to come together and, 
and try to optimize the cost for the overall solution, right? Not just hardware, but put software on it and see whether there's, you know, they can work together and optimize the overall cost of ownership for, for the business, right? For that particular solution, right? So typically in an x86 environment, right? I just, you know, finish off with this one example, right? Um, about 10% of the cost is for hardware. The remaining 80% is for hardware. And then you can say 10 to 15% on other dimensions of TCO that I talked about, right? Um, so, so one of the things that you can do is, you know, since software makes up 80, 90% of your overall TCO, go look at that big chunk and see how you can reduce the cost of that chunk, right? If you can lower that overall cost of software, then you can uh, reduce the overall TCO, right? That's the biggest chunk you wanna focus on and reduce, uh, reduce that cost, right? So I know I did a big explanation of the TCO and all of that, but it comes down to this, right? Minimize your software costs, and that's the you know, simple message, right? Minimize your software costs, and that would get to you to optimize your TCO as well. So uh, long explanation, but that's the simple message at the end. No, no, Jay Paul. I think it, yeah, it absolutely uh, is. Uh, you know, uh, is what we have also seen because yeah. the moment you talk about uh, manpower reduction or the efforts reduction uh, in the TCO studies, right? Uh, I have seen and it, I personally experienced that it gets shot down, right? And yep. uh, what That's it really right. boils down to is hardware, software, and to a certain extent, the data center costs. These yeah. are the three uh, key dimensions. And it was an eye opener uh, to you know uh, hear from you that uh, I mean an x86 environment the cost of hardware is negligible but you have a significant high software cost and and uh, we know that you know if you have to maintain it over a period of five years or ten years right obviously the software maintenance are much higher as compared to hardware maintenance so that also adds up to it the Absolutely. moment you put the time horizon on it. Uh, given these circumstances and uh, these observations, Jaipal, uh, the infrastructure we choose today has to be really flexible uh, to the changing business needs and to the TCO benefits uh, in the long term. Yeah. So, uh, Jaipal, can you please share more on how IBM Linux One platform uh, is the choice for mission critical workloads? And how does it provide flexibility and the consolidation benefits? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sure, Ravi. So, so before I talk about Linux One and explain what Linux One is, right, you know, let's talk about what the different kinds of workloads are, right? Let's start there first, sure. right? So there is, you know, there are things, uh, workloads or components that require sort of scale up, right? These are, Things like um, you know your databases, your batch workloads, your big enterprise systems, uh, ERP systems with with lot with, which requires lots of core and memory and all of that. These are these large systems that you know you could add capacity to the existing server and the performance goes up. So as as your workload grows, right? As your capacity as as your business grows. Your workload grows, and and you want to quickly uh, augment the capacity. You can add more um, uh, capacity to it, you know, to the same workload, to the same VM, same server, and and you immediately grow without any interruption in the business, right? So those are your scale up sort of workloads. Then there are these other workloads, right? Basically, a lot of your front ending workloads. It could be your web servers, your app servers, etc. That you know, if if the demand grows, you know, temporarily or permanently, you want to spawn off new instances of that workload, and you know, uh, and manage manage the demands that way, right? So you're scaling out, you're just creating more and more instances of it across your server infrastructure, and um, you know, you can you can meet your businesses growing demands, right? So there, there are these kind of workloads. Of course, there are these modern container workloads with microservices architecture and all of that, where, you know, it automatically spawns new uh, instances um, 
you know, as and when the demand grows, right? You can set targets on it, and if, if certain targets are hit, new instances are spawned automatically, right? So that's that's a more newer sort of architecture and technologies that are out there, right? So containers are gaining a lot of traction. We're seeing a lot of microservices architecture and solutions, which implies that you need these scale up. But traditional workloads are mainly scale ups, right? Um, that's scale ups. Uh, your databases, that's not going to change. You're not going to spawn new database instances. You're basically making sure that your databases can handle all of the workloads thrown at it, a lot of all of the queries thrown at it, right? So this is where Linux One comes in, right? These, it can address, it's a server from IBM built on a lot of the technologies borrowed from our mainframe class of service, right? IBM Z. So we borrowed a lot of those technologies. So massive scales are possible, um, uh, you know, with very high reliability and all of that. But when it comes to scale up and scale out, you can do scale up on the same server by, uh, you know, adding more capacity dynamically, more compute memory, network, et cetera, dynamically to the existing workload without any downtime, nothing like that. Um, and as well as spawn new scale out instances, right? Um, as and when the demand goes up um, quite easily because there's spare capacity. You can plan for that uh, capacity on demand. So if you don't need that capacity, you can shut it down. All of those things are possible on this um, server from IBM, right? Uh, and it's, it's possible because it provides a very unique architecture that is different from your typical x86 servers or other HCI kind of technologies that are out there. Um, and and amazing virtualization technologies, right? Um, uh, IBM, by the way, invented virtualization, you know, 40 years ago on on the on this platform, right? So, so highly mature virtualization technology on the server that allows for the scale up, scale out uh, capabilities on the same server. Okay, so so if you want to know the scale of this thing, you know. You can run tens of thousands of VMs on a single server instance, right? Unheard of, right? That's the scale that we are talking about. You can run, you know, hundreds of thousands of container instances, um, you know, in, uh, on the single server instance, right? Hundreds of thousands of container server instances, or maybe more, right? So th that's the scale we are talking about on this platform. Um, so uh, if if a solution is deployed um, on the server, it may require, it will require fewer number of cores because it performs really well. So, so one of the things that we look at is how many cores of x86 or, or Linux one is required to run, um, you know, certain number of uh, the same, same workload on x86, right? So what we have seen in the field and the many studies that uh, me and, and the team has done, right, um, is that, uh, you know, about 10 to 15 x86 cores is equivalent to one core on Linux one. So massive consolidation. And since most of the um, software is licensed based on the compute capacity or the course, um, you know, it significantly reduces the, um, software licensing costs, the software procurement costs, and the software subscription costs, right? So so this platform with all of those capabilities, uh, you know, scale up, scale out, and all of that would also help you reduce your overall TCR, right? So, so that's sort of in a nutshell what this platform can do and is capable of and, and provide this agile uh, thing, right? So, so I talked about a lot of this in a very technology, uh, you know, basis, technology perspective. But on your, based on your experience, uh, Ravi, um, what are the key result areas or KPIs for a CEO, especially in the current business environment? Um, can you can you put that in perspective a little bit? Yeah, uh, I, I I would say, uh, Jay Paul. Uh, 
at, at the CXO level, whether it is the CEOs or even the CIOs or for organizations, uh, there is a big uh, business responsibility uh, attached. And, and especially when I talk about CIOs, I mean, uh, you know, yeah. uh, it is not just about IT responsibility because gone are the days when IT was just a processing unit, right? It is, yeah. it is the offering itself now. So uh, it, it is about uh, you are actually delivering the business experience. The customer experience is now residing. A lot of it is residing with IT. Uh, yeah. and, and that is where I would say there are a few areas which are of, you know, which would always be at the top of the mind of the CIOs, right? The first one definitely is availability. Availability of the business, availability of the, uh, I mean, the applications, uh, resiliency, because the moment your service is unavailable, right? The next, very next minute, you are going to see tweets, you are going to see WhatsApp forwards, you know, and, and the works, right? And, and the more uh, retail oriented the business is, the uh, more is the need for having the, you know, high availability at the right layers of the infrastructure and the application because uh, it is not just about the social media impact all you know it mm. is also about the regulatory impact right imagine a banks uh, you know uh, uh, who has a downtime okay uh, leave the twitter's uh, you know twitter feeds and whatsapp uh, forwards but uh, you know the regulator is also going to ask you these questions right as to what happened right uh, yeah. Because that's the uh, availability of service promise, uh, which is which is there, right? Uh, the second is uh, about innovation, right? And when I say innovation, it is linked to the speed to market. In the the moment we are talking about IT or technology becoming the offering itself, which means that the anything that you bring in bring to the market, it will be copied very easily. So if we have a new idea, if we have a new application to be rolled out. The success is how fast can we roll out this application, right? How fast can it be? Uh, can it give us profits, right? You know, uh, it, it is as simple as that. So time to market uh, in in such scenarios is, is extremely essential, and that is where uh, the thing is: Do I is my infrastructure ready? Is my uh, platform ready to do this? Because not every time I can go to a public cloud and just draw, uh, you know, power there, right? In the sense that uh, uh, there are cost considerations to it, there are boundaries, there are security considerations to it. So, you know, uh, at at a uh, at, as an organization, what is my uh, level of agility? Uh, and it, it is a classic. If I have to talk in the manufacturing terms, it is classic uh, make versus buy kind of a decision. Yep. And that that was uh, that is what uh, really plays uh, on the minds. Last but not the least, I mean, there will be many things, but you know, the third biggest important, uh, big, uh, I mean, most important uh, thing is about data security and privacy. Every dialogue that you have today, okay, is focusing around how do I make sure that data is available, uh, data, uh, I mean, data is uh, secure, and I'm not violating any of the privacy norms. Okay, uh, I have to do it within my uh, available budgets. So that piece is always there. It's not that I, I will give some additional money because I have to do the same processing and yeah. I still have to you know still keep the data secure. So these are the you know top three things that come to my mind, Jay Paul. So yeah, yeah, well, well, well put. Yeah, those those are definitely the top things that um, keeps the CIO, CXO is awake at night, right? Uh, thinking about all of those things, but um, just just to put it one level lower, right? Uh, what are, what's the popular middleware and technologies that you see that are being used in enterprises across India? I mean, specifically in the geography, right? Uh, what, do, what do you see the clients mostly relying on? Okay, so I, I think it's a quite a no brainer here, uh, Jay Paul. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, as far as databases are concerned, most commonly used RDBMS is the Oracle uh, database across uh, uh, across industries, across businesses, across organizations. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and uh, you you we do see a lot of other uh, databases also coming up, but uh, 
by far oracle has been uh, you know the biggest uh, uh, i would say landscape available and uh, if i look at from a middleware standpoint application servers websphere and weblogic are most commonly used in the industry okay. uh, and if i look at the new generation of workloads okay uh, which are uh, de facto container workloads right that is where the red hat open shift is uh, the most popular today uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you know uh, maximum interoperability we see uh, when we uh, really look at OpenShift deployments. I can uh, keep the workload on premise. I can keep the workload in public cloud. I can move them around. Uh, you know, uh, that is uh, something there. Now, these are some of the things which are uh, uh, which have an enterprise grade support available, and there is a cost attached to it, right? Yeah. Uh, Apart from this, there are a lot of open source uh, technology uh, uh, technologies as well, right? Uh, you you can uh, think of Apache Tomcat for web layer. You know, some enterprises are going for uh, a- application servers, right? Uh, uh, so you have JBoss there, right? So you know, those are uh, you know the workloads which are coming up. But still, I would say, you know, majority is still uh, if an organization has to go for it, they go for the inter- uh, where they get the enterprise rate of support, right? Yeah. And if I have to look at NoSQL databases, uh, I would say MongoDB is a one NoSQL database, which has, you know, uh, 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 our teams have encountered very often. And, uh, uh, you know, that kind of makes it uh, the list, right? In the sense that these are some of the databases which have been really popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, in fact, not just databases, but uh, the application softwares, uh, which are uh, really popular across industries, and they're not just restricted to one particular industry. There. Yeah, that's that's a good good summary, um, uh, Ravi. And uh, yeah, and and basically, what I'm hearing is Oracle is is uh, you know basically the de facto database RDBMS server, and then you have Red Hat. OpenShift container platform as a de facto container platform, and then of course there are the other middleware technologies uh, that are there, right? So, yeah, that, I mean that that is a good good description of that landscape. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah. So, uh, Jay Paul, you got that, you know. Uh, uh, while uh, when I mentioned these technologies, uh, there is a huge uh, amount of. Uh, uh, I would say cost also attached, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And that is what really the you know uh, CIOs and uh, the IT teams are always concerned about. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there has to be uh, some I would say uh, logic in the sprawl that we see across workloads on on these kind of uh, you know. Uh, uh, deployments. Yeah. Now, uh, that basically brings us to one important point, Jaipal, and I would like your views on this. Uh, how do we uh, ensure that, you know, these costs are really kept in control? Okay. How do we yeah. help the IT teams to keep uh, this in their budget? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. So, so back to your, um, you know, uh, answer about the technologies being used and Oracle being the most common, um, you know, database server out there. Uh, that's the news in India, right? Uh, almost all of the uh, enterprises that I know of that I worked with does use uh, Oracle, and and I come across that all the time, right? And and it is one of the most expensive software uh, in the enterprise, right? That very very expensive. But then it is also one of the best RDBMS out there, right? Uh, and how do and enterprises trust that uh, trust Oracle to run their business, right? There's no doubt about it. But then, you know, if you look at that cost, it's it's sometimes even prohibitive, right? Some businesses find it very difficult to um, to to subscribe to those kind of licenses and pay for those costs. So this is where Linux One can come, right, and reduce your uh, Oracle software footprint, and hence reduce the Oracle software cost, right? So, so if you recall when I said earlier, right, Linux One, um, 
you know, the consolidation ratio of x86 to Linux one core is about 10, meaning that one Linux core can run about 10 x86 cores. So if you deploy Oracle databases on Linux one, right, uh, you're basically reducing your software subscriptions uh, by a factor of five, uh, which means your Oracle software subscriptions and subscription costs go, you know, gets reduced to about 20%, right? Which is pretty huge, right? Um, the same same thing with, uh, you know, you talked about uh, Red Hat OpenShift, right? S same, same kind of thing, right? If you can reduce your Red Hat OpenShift um, software subscription costs by, a, you know, by eight or 10, right, even, right? So, so by, re by deploying these workloads, these software on Linux One, as opposed to x86, whether it's on-prem or on the cloud, you can reduce your software costs quite a bit and hence reduce um, uh, your overall TCO and be within the budget um, planned by the CIO, CFO, et cetera, right? And, and uh, you know, uh, reduce all of those costs for the businesses that you're in charge of, yeah? So uh, great point there, uh, Jaypal, uh, 5X to 10X kind of reductions are significant. Uh, yeah. They can fund many things uh, within the IT budget. Now, in addition to the TCO, what benefits uh, would a Linux one user stand to gain? Yeah, right. So, so just don't look at TCO alone. Yeah, I always tell my clients that. Um, apart from the reduction in TCO, you get lots of other benefits, right? And I, I think I touched upon some of these things. The massive scale, right? Um, a single Linux one server is equivalent to about 2000 x86 cores, right? Massive, right? And, and so, so you can consolidate lots of workloads on this single server, right? So you can, and you don't have to buy all of that capacity at once. You can buy, uh, you know, even a single core of Linux one on day one. And then as your business grow or as your capacity needs grow, you can start buying or activating cores on that machine as and when required, right? So, so that's, another key concept of Linux one, right? Don't buy everything that you need for the next five years today, but grow as your businesses grow, right? Um, really high performance, which leads to uh, this massive, uh, you know, reduction in software costs, so reduction in number of cores, right? Um, high perform, I mean, and high reliability. I mean, you can achieve, uh, you know, six, nine availability, right, on the server. It's, it's so highly reliable um, that it never fails. There's, you know, zero downtime, zero planned downtime, et cetera, unplanned downtime, et cetera, right? And then, of course, uh, you know, Ravi was talking about security and all of that. Um, it is one key thing that, um, you know, is definitely keeping all of the CISOs and CIOs and CEOs, et cetera, uh, up at night. Um, you know, Linux One, you can encrypt everything, right? There's a tremendous amount of encryption capability on the server. Um, um, each core comes with its own um, crypto accelerators for encrypting. It's got compression and hardware. It's got an HSM that's the highest that provides the highest level of uh, um, uh, uh, level of uh, security, right? It's uh, 140 uh, level four level of uh, kind of security, um, uh, and you can encrypt everything, right? You can encrypt data at rest, data in flight, data in use, uh, which is not possible on other commodity hardware. Uh, you know that 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 you see, uh, you know, where, where these solutions are deployed, right? So all of these are, um, uh, you know, additional benefits of Linux One, and it's just not the TCO, right? 
I, I hope I answered your question. Okay, great there. point, uh, Jay Paul. Uh, uh, you know, you brought about a lot of things, and uh, I yep. before we conclude, let me just summarize a few things uh, for the audience. So, Linux One as a platform is built for scale. Uh, whether it is scaling up, uh, which is more and more resources to the same uh, uh, virtual machine or uh, the server, or scale out. You know, within within the same machine, you can either scale up or scale out which is a very big flexibility as far as workloads are concerned. Uh, needless to say, we talked about lowering the total cost of ownership by reducing the licensing costs significantly. And uh, it is not of 30% or 50%. We are actually talking about 5x to 10x. And if you're on some older generation hardware, it could go as high as 15x as well. Right, right? yeah. So this is this is about, you know, uh, massive, uh, uh, optimization. At the same time, this is probably one of the most secure, uh, I would say it is the most secure infrastructure which is available uh, on Linux platforms. Uh, it, the security features are all derived from the IBM mainframe uh, technologies. So needless to say, they, uh, they conform to the highest standards of security. So uh, my last comment here would be that if uh, you are really interested in knowing how to reduce the infrastructure TCO, uh, do call us for a no charge IT economic study. Uh, we would be glad to sit with your teams or with you and uh, do an analysis of how can we really reduce the total cost of ownership with respect to hardware and software. Because it is not just the primary site, it is about primary plus high availability plus DR. And we do have a lot of innovative architectures available, which reduce the total cost of ownership. So that's all uh, from uh, me and Jay Paul here. Thank you, Jay Paul, for uh, a, a really uh, insightful talk. And I would uh, hand this over to Mohit uh, at this stage. Thanks, Ravi. Um, it was a wonderful conversation with you this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Jay Paul. All Good right. Over to you. So that was indeed an insightful discussion. So now we can actually take some of the questions from the audience. But before we start taking the audience questions, just a quick reminder and, and request, please remember to participate in the survey after the webinar ends. So with this, let's uh, have a look at what questions do we have. And by the way, if you haven't sent in your questions yet, now is the time to send them so that our speakers can address them live. So while the audience is sending their questions, uh, I think we have one question here. Can you please explain a bit more on what is the unique architecture of the next one to re help reduce the software costs? Jay Ravi, Paul or Ravi, who wants to address this? It's a, it's a great question. In fact, uh, during uh, the time when Jay Paul was talking, I wanted to ask him this question. So, how can you do 10x is to one or you know 8x is to one? So, Jay Paul, do you want to elaborate upon what kind of coprocessors and the overall architecture is briefly? Yes, certainly, Ravi. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get this question all the time, right? What magic is there in Linux One that you know allows for this? Kind of consolidation ratio, right? You're saying, um, you know, 10, 10 x86 scores equivalent can be done, workload equivalent can be done on a single uh, Linux one core. I mean, what's the magic in there, right? And and there are there are many little things uh, uh, and some major things that are that has gone into the architecture of the Linux one architecture, uh, Linux one server. Number one. It is the fastest processor, right? Um, it's at least two x times faster in clock speed alone um, compared to your standard uh, x86 um, uh, processors, right? Um, they run at 5.2 gigahertz. Um, you know, some of the uh, more common x86, um, uh, uh, you know, Intel uh, Cascade Lakes even run at about two and a half, three gigahertz. Um, uh, right, so that alone shows that there is a good significant improvement there. Um, there's also, you know, it's not just the course that you see that the application see that are on the machine, right? There are um, cores that 
offload IO, right? So all of the IO um, to access your memory, to access your peripheral devices, all of that is um, uh, handed off, offloaded off to, um, you know, system as processes um, that does all of that IO processing, right? So it frees up your main processes just to do the real work, right? It's not waiting on IO, it's not waiting on retrieving um, you know data from memory or you know talking to your network devices etc cetera, etc cetera, right so so that's another factor there is internal networking right you're consolidating all of these networks and there is there is networking inside um, you know you can either call it the hypersockets or SNC which network at the speed of memory right so again uh, you know reducing your network latencies and transaction times and things like that, right? So, so there is lots of internal networking that happens at memory speeds that doesn't have to go to your external interface cards or routers and switches and comes back, right? Um, the, the, um, the firmware capabilities are even better, right? Um, a lot of the code that you see is buried in the, your, your workload management for for dispatch of workloads happen on the firmware, right? At the hardware level, right? Most of the time in x86, it's all done at the software level, right? If you look at ESX hypervisors or KVM hypervisors, it all, all the dispatches happen at the software level. This is all buried inside hardware, right? So hardware speed trumps your software speed any day, right? Um, there are, so, so then there is, um, you know, of course, crypto processors built into every core. So if you're doing encryption, um, there's nothing like it. This is the fastest way to encrypt your data, whether it is in flight or in use or at rest, right? This, you know, this is hardware level encryption, not software encryption. Um, and, and I may be missing out on a lot of the other, other things over here, um, but all of these contribute to that level of consolidation and performance that we are talking about. Uh, I hope I didn't go over my time answering no, that no, question, I, but there's a lot to talk about over there, Ravi. You are right. So uh, uh, just to summarize, CPU is better. You have a lot of co-processors for memory and IO yeah. access, which in increase the uh, overall bandwidth. And CPU does the job, which is supposed to do, which is to process the workload. And a uh, lot of virtualization capabilities in the hardware itself, which uh, really gives a boost to the performance. There is one question, Jay Paul, which is uh, LT1 is a multi-frame, LT2 is a single frame on Linux 1.3. Uh, yeah. uh, in one document, uh, Ms. Sharma found out that LT1 was mentioned as a single frame. So yeah. I think that must be a typo, right? LT1 should be the multi-frame, right? So, so uh, yes and no, right? Okay. But uh, um, LT1 is a server that can scale from a single frame all the way to four frames, right? So depending on the configuration, if you want fewer cores, uh, you know, let's say you want to be 34 cores maximum on a server and limited number of IO interface cards, you can start off with a single frame, right? But then as your business grows, um, as you need more and more compute capacity or network capacity or memory, you can add, keep on adding additional frames. So you can go from a single frame to a second frame, to a third frame, to a fourth frame, right? So, um, so some documents may start off with a, a single frame uh, showing LT1 as a single frame, uh, but that's where you start, uh, or that's where you could start. Um, and then, you know, it can go all the way up to four frames to, to deliver the full capacity. And L2, uh, LT2 is definitely a single. Frame. LT2, yeah, that that is a, a business class machine, if I may call it that, um, and it is limited to a single frame. Uh, and that's for the uh, single frame deployments. That is correct. So I yeah. hope we answered your question, uh, Ms. Sharma. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And so in the interest of time, we'll take one more question. So what are the unique uh, security features of Linux one that is not available in other systems? Ravi, do you want me to take that as yeah, well? Yeah, please, Paul, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I think I touched upon some of the capabilities 
um, right? But to summarize that, uh, and I'll do that very quickly. One is, um, like I said, encryption with every core, right? So hardware level encryption with every core, we call that CPACF, um, uh, you know, it's a cryptography facility uh, that, that's in the server. So you don't have to uh, worry about any overhead of encryption. It's very low overhead. You typically, when you do this software encryption, you have to, you know, account for at least 20 to 25 percent additional compute capacity, and you don't have to do that on the server, right? Because every core comes with its own crypto core processor. It's got um, um, HSM, uh, which is the highest rated HSM uh, in the industry, level four. Um, uh, FIPS 40-2 level four, if you want the technical uh, uh, details for it. And, and this, this is tamper-proof, tamper-evident. So any kind of tampering um, not only, uh, you know, disables that device, but zeroes out everything, right? That's there. So, so it's a highly capable HSM that's there uh, for storing your master keys, uh, doing key exchanges, um, uh, it's a high performance encryption engine with, uh, that supports um, almost all of the crypto algorithms that are out there, right? So these capabilities then allow for some higher level security features on this platform, right? So pervasive encryption, you encrypt end to end, right? Um, digital privacy passports. So, so your uh, uh, you know, it's it's a technology that's unique on this platform where you allow the data to go out of the platform, but still uh, keep all of the security, encryption, masking, all of those features uh, along with the data that it travels along with the data. Right? There is um, HyperProtect uh, virtual servers that that basically um, sort of puts a shield around your workload, your entire workload, that it's unbreakable. Right? Everything inside that VM becomes, or inside that container becomes encrypted and secure, and there's no greater security out there, right? Uh, so these are some of the things that, that are enabled on this uh, Linux One server, okay? Great, I'm sure that has uh, addressed the query. So uh, in case you have any further questions, you can share definitely reach out to the IBM team uh, at the given contact details. But with the interest of time, we'll have to uh, end this session here. So that's all we have for today. I thank uh, Ravi and Jay Paul for sharing their insights. I'm sure there have been many takeaways for the audience. And I also thank the audience for their interest, time, and participating in this webinar. Just one thing, please remember to send your responses in the survey, which will open in the browser uh, after the webinar ends. Thank you once again, Jay Paul and Ravi. And thank you, audience. Have a great day. Thank you so much. And please feel free to reach out to us if there are any questions, clarifications. We'll be really glad to get in touch with you and take the dialogue forward. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.